Hi everybody. So I'm here today to uh, share my thoughts about uh, correctness uh, of software, how to define it, how to prove correctness, uh, and why not how to test it. And just test this are uh, one of the aspects of code correctness. Not just because you have a few unit tests or even large code coverage, your software is for this reason algorithmically correct. It has been known for uh, quite some time, at least uh, as far back as the great work done by Alan Turing back in the 30s, that there's no automatic and completely reliable way to ensure that a given program will terminate without errors. But in any case, computer science is mostly based on approximation and uh, so in this regard, be forewarned that you likely have a bug in some area of your code is still a valuable help. Especially if you scale this up to the size of a modern project, you can really see where the value is. So to move towards code correctness, you need in general a tool that is called, goes under the umbrella name of static analyzer. And be sure as you do that, that a static analysis tool will probably won't give you absolute certainties, but uh, at least this tool working in real time as you write your classes and your method can give immediate feedback about what is possibly wrong in your implementation. So after this uh, implementation, this uh, sort of in introduction, let's uh, see what is the implementation of this presentation, this uh, webinar. So this is the expected uh, table of content and uh, we focus basically around uh, three main topics. Uh, definition and uh, examples of code correctness, how to manage with code, uh, how to deal with code correctness. A specific technology, .NET based, that is uh, the technological instrumentation that uh, guarantees approach, valid approach to correctness, so code contracts. I think that everybody needs code contracts, but only a few people today realize that they really know, they really need it. And then we third part after a long demo session, we'll uh, talk about uh, static analysis uh, in relationship with uh, unit tests. Um, on MSDN Magazine, specifically under the cutting edge column section, you can find a selection of articles I wrote in the past few months on the specific topic of code contracts and code analysis. So let's start uh, having a look at uh, the, the foundation of code correctness and related .NET technologies. So what's that? Well, in abstract terms, uh, correctness is uh, when a program just meets expectations. Nice, but what are expectations? On the other hand, meeting expectations would be so easy if only one could formally and extensively define expectations. And this is the root, the mother of all or most problems we have today in software. Because the complexity of software we face today, we build today, has grown significantly, especially I would say in the .NET space compared to the Java space. Uh, if I try to compare the two camps, I would say that the complexity has grown more linearly in the past 15 years. In the Java space, it has been, the complexity has been pretty flat for, uh, for about uh, uh, the first half of this uh, uh, 15 years, and it exploded and uh, started you know, going up like this uh, a few years after the introduction uh, of .NET, so starting with the first years of the past decade. So today the main problem we have uh, as far as design of software is concerned is uh, writing classes, uh, writing in general software that really meets expectations. And 
The problem is that expectations are hardly, rarely defined with the right level of definition. Software is not like math. Software is not something to which theorems, um, abstract reasoning can be reliably and extensively applied. So uh, in software, a lot is left to approximation and also our definition of correctness when a program just meets expectations has to be has to be refined to be when a program sort of meets expectations. Design by contract is uh, in terms of in, in more formal terms is uh, the closer we can get in software to the idea, the abstract idea of correctness. And uh, design by contract is uh, a methodology that was introduced quite a few years ago by uh, um, Bertrand Meyer in the context of the Eiffel language. And in abstract terms, it defines uh, the agreement that establishes between uh, the author of a class and the author of a class that calls into the other. So between uh, a class and its clients. You, you, you should think it in terms of each class exposes its own public contract, its own agreement with clients, its own terms of service. And this is done expressing essentially conditions. And then there is all around a sort of invisible big brother that look over any dynamics that establishes between uh, classes, your classes and clients, sometimes your same clients, and uh, ensures the big brother that this dynamics uh, is uh, respectful of the terms of service. What kind of conditions? So you express, you do design by contract essentially defining a set of conditions per each method in each class. Conditions are basically of three types. We have a pre-execution conditions, we have a post-execution conditions, and then we have a third category of conditions, conditions that are object-wide and always verified. Now the technical name of these three conditions that I deliberately tried up to this stage to keep uh, quite, you know, general, neutral, the, name of this, the names of these conditions are for pre-execution conditions, we normally call them pre-conditions. Post-execution conditions are normally known as uh, post-conditions. Object-wide conditions are normally known as invariants. But before we get to some Visual Studio code that illustrates uh, in the context of a real concrete technology like .NET code contracts, uh, let me briefly spend a few words about the concept of the big brother that we need to have underneath or around and surrounding our applications uh, to ensure that correctness that is more or less formally defined can really be enforced. In software, the, any environment that promises to prove or guarantee reliably correctness cannot just work without this sort of a big brother. So the question is, where is my big brother? Depending on the language, depending on the framework, depending on the platform where you are trying to achieve code correctness, the big brother lives in different places. For example, in the Eiffel language in the beginning, so when the design by contract methodology was first formalized quite a few years ago, it was straightly embedded in the language. In .NET instead you find it embedded in the framework. So if you use .NET, if you base your application on .NET, you have available not as part of a, of a language compiler but as part of the framework, as a library, you have available uh, this big brother, this ecosystem of tools and classes. Uh, the third option that is pretty common in Java and JavaScript is that you achieve uh, tools, you, you get tools for uh, 
proving correctness uh, by simply linking an external library. In .NET, the ecosystem of code contracts is made of a bunch of libraries, a bunch of classes, and uh, a bunch of tools. Classes are essentially one, uh, the contract class, a class that you find in the namespace system diagnostics uh, um, contracts, and uh, it's just one class with a bunch of static methods, and the various static methods you find on this class provide for invariants, provide for uh, uh, preconditions, postconditions, and a few other facilities. And then the tools that form, that belong to the code contracts .NET ecosystem provide the implementation of the notorious and so-called Big Brother. So uh, one of the tools uh, you find in the code contracts ecosystem is called the IL Rewriter and uh, this is a tool that runs has a post compile step during the building of any project that is configured to use code contracts and it has the name suggests all it does is simply rewriting the IL code and uh, so, so that the code that physically is run the x86 code that is physically run then on your machine uh, is slightly different. Um, I will give a demo of this in just a few minutes. Another tool that is fairly important to mention and that we will see in action uh, later on during this uh, webinar is the static checker. The static checker is the code contracts uh, static analysis tool, all it does is reading through your code and builds a knowledge base. It tries to understand facts. It tries to collect facts about your software. It tries to understand essentially what is the input and the output of each method and, and function and uh, what is the content and the expected content of each of the variables it finds along the way. And then the static checker, whenever it finds some sort of conflict, it just throws a warning, which is simply a way to call your attention on a particular area, particular and small, very you know, tiny section of your code for further investigation. A static anal analyzer is not the repository of the absolute truth. It can definitely be wrong. It can definitely generate false positives. It's all about the old motto of forewarned is for, for harm. And now, after this uh, uh, relatively quick introduction, let me prove you that you need code contracts, you always needed code contracts, but just you didn't know. So what I have here ready for you is uh, a simple class, the classic calculator that you find demonstrated nearly everywhere in the realm of software, in the whole spectrum of software, categories of software, there's always room for introducing, presenting a calculator demo. And also, in this case, also core contracts are no exception. The class you see now is uh, minimal. It has uh, a couple of methods, a method sum and a method divide. But now, buried in the summary, in the comments for uh, the various the two methods, we have uh, some expectations, we have some requirements, and specifically the requirements, the business rules for this class, which could easily be a section of our domain model. Business rules say that uh, uh, the method sum is forced to sum two numbers, but only if both are greater than zero or equal zero. Same for divide with a further uh, condition that the divider cannot be zero. So we do have 
a few rules around a very simple, trivial, basic, minimal mathemat mathematical operation. So what we want to have, what is the real core of our method sum is simply the highlighted code is just making x plus y and returning whatever that calculation has generated. This is our code core code. Everything else, enforcing business rules, enforcing um, that numbers are in the proper range, in the proper range of values, is part of the surrounding code. They are just aspects. Handling exception, logging, these are just aspects. And what my it, what is exactly my purpose now is just showing you that there are so many aspects in even in a simple, trivial, bare minimum piece of code like the one you see now. But with code contracts, uh, you can keep a lot of these aspects to a minimum and improving, not just reducing, just improving the overall readability of software. So let me switch to a second version slightly improved version of this code. Your purpose is implementing business rules and business rules in this case say that you have to ensure that X and Y, the two parameters of the method sum, are never negative values. So a good pattern is the if-then throw pattern which means you place at the very beginning of each method you have a a if statement that checks a condition and then it throws an exception if that condition is verified. But now, have a look at uh, the highlighted code. The code is if x less than 0 or y less than 0, throw new argument exception. This is not exactly how requirement. This is the opposite. So when you follow the classic traditional if-then-throw pattern in the writing of a method in a class, you write your preconditions. This is actually nothing more than a precondition. But when you write your precondition, you are obviously forced to indicate what would break the class, not what's required. Sounds like this is a, a, a minor point. Well, Yes, I, I realize this aspect, but I'm not so concerned. On the other hand, it's just all about, you know, reverting a Boolean expression. But project this to the old world project, where you have a, a lot of, where you have a, a lot of, uh, um, of classes where you have uh, a lot of methods and uh, well readability decreases and just uh, using the right version of a boolean statement uh, can um, can make a huge difference let's go ahead here is uh, another version even more improved of the calculator. Basically, uh, we have here the same method sum that has a, that has a, a precondition if x less than zero or y less than zero pro new exception, then it performs the operation and then we want to add yet another level of control for correctness of this, for ensuring that this code is correct. We want to guarantee that the code works if numbers, if input parameters are positive, and we also want guarantee, we want to make it clear that if the input is correct, the function executes and the function returns a positive value. So we want to check also the output, and we need to place this code, we need this code that checks a post execution condition right after the core code of the function has executed. So right here. And we make a simple check in this trivial example. We check whether the result, so the calculated value is greater, is less than zero, then we throw an exception. 
So we have uh, preconditions and we also have post conditions. And now my question to you is, do you still think that you really need code contracts? Actually, if you are a very, very, very well disciplined developer, self-disciplined developer actually, uh, you can quite easily implement uh, following good programming patterns, uh, you can implement uh, uh, forms of correctness. Sure, it works, but there are a few other ways to improve this code. Now, let me show you that uh, this is no longer the worst condition ever you can face on your way towards uh, correctness. What if, in particular, a piece of code uh, a little bit more sophisticated than this trivial sum has multiple exit points? Here is an example. This is a, yet another way of rewriting that sum method so that we first have a, a check on uh, preliminary conditions, then we have a shortcut exit. In, in particular, for the sake of this, uh, of this example, if x and y are the same, then I go for an optimized operation and I use a bitwise shift to, which is a form of optimization for doubling uh, a value. So if, if, if you get into this branch, we perform the operation in a different way using a different algorithm and then we still need, because this is an exit branch, we still need to place to duplicate here our post condition code, the code that evaluates post execution conditions. And then our code continues by uh, simply performing in the traditional way, in the standard default way, the operation, and then running again the code that verifies that the output we're going to return matches the expectation, the, the terms of service for the calculator class and for the sum class. Now, we started from this code for the method sum, just one line. We ended up, once we have put in place all of the business rules that our domain, our problem, our business domain required, we ended up with a significantly longer code. More importantly, this code contains duplicates. Yes, you can improve a little bit the writability of this code. You can compact the body of the sum method by doing some refactoring. Uh, in particular, you can uh, you can uh, go with uh, an extract method pattern and maybe move uh, this code to a separate method that you can simply call without duplication from other places of the method and the system. You can improve things a little bit via classic refactoring techniques. Fact is that implementing correctness manually in your code without a big brother that runs all around the sum method and uh, makes sure that uh, things go according to expectations, that would be a great help. And now finally, let's close up all of these windows and let me show you the final format of the sum method when we, once we introduced the code contracts specifically, once we added the system.diagnostics.contracts namespace, we, you don't need to add to reference any extra assembly because uh, classes and this namespace entirely live in the MS core lib assembly that is automatically referenced by every uh, .NET project. So the sum method is now pretty trivial because it has a, a couple of lines which represent the core implementation. So if x equals y, we go with a bitwise operation, otherwise we go with a classic sum. And uh, before the body has the only other segment of code 
in this method, we just have contracts. And contracts look like this. We express through the requires method on the static method on the contract class, we express one of our uh, requirements. We require for uh, this method to run correctly that x is greater or equal zero and y is greater of or equals zero. And comparing this to the classic if then throw statement, we see that the direction of the Boolean expression is now different. So we are not denying a condition to throw an exception. We say we are throwing an exception if the condition you see here is not verified. So we require that the other condition is true, which makes a lot easier for you to read and understand the code when you get to it months later, years later, or just weeks later during a refactoring session or perhaps during a peer review session. So much for requires. The syntax of this method is contract.requires of t and the t is a t exception, is the type of exception you want to be thrown in case uh, the Boolean condition is not verified. And now let's consider post conditions. The method in the .NET uh, code contracts implementation is called ensures and it takes uh, a Boolean expression and uh, the statements we make by using this code is, well, this method ensures that upon completion the following Boolean condition is verified. What is the condition we want to express as true? through at the end of the execution of the sum method. Basically, we say that the result being returned by this method is greater or equals zero. But we don't have a way to reference the value being returned by a function. When we write the return code of a function, we, have a we can have, we typically have a return and then an expression return and then an expression. How can we point to the value being calculated by the expression we associate with the return statement? It is exactly the purpose of the expression you see highlighted now. So the result of T method on the contract class just represents a way to reference indirectly the return, the, va the return value that this method is going to send out uh, to its clients. Uh, result of t and t in this case is just the return type of the function. So, admittedly, this code looks uh, much better, much nicer. You have uh, the body and then you have uh, a section where you declare your expectations. The excellent point about code contracts is that uh, not just they help you writing better code the first time, but they also provide guidance when you later on got back to the same code and try to refactor it or try to fix some bugs because uh, code contracts are still here part of your source code reminding you that well this function, the terms of service, the user's agreement with this method is requires that arguments are greater than zero and the return value is guaranteed to be greater than zero. Nice. Um, a technical aspect to consider if you want to try, if you want to write your first test application using code contracts is that essentially uh, to be all set, you need to do an extra step beyond, of course, upgrading, installing .NET 4. Because .NET 4 gives you, through the MS Core Lib assembly, all of the classes you need, specifically the contract class and the various namespaces. But it doesn't give you the big brother. 
the big brother is not included in the standard implementation of uh, download the standard .NET 4 download. So you have to go to the to the Microsoft Research website and uh, download um, the Code Contracts API, uh, specifically the tools. Tools include the IL Rewriter, the real Big Brother, plus the Static Checker, and then there is also a third additional tool if you want that makes sense to use when you are putting your uh, uh, contracts for your classes into a separate assembly. Um, okay, once you are all set in terms of classes and in terms of uh, of, of tools, you create your project. You start using your contracts classes, but if you want to make sure that the big brothers really kicks in when needed, you have to right click on uh, uh, your projects node, select properties, and then you see that Visual Studio 2010 has an extra tab at the bottom of the list. It's called code contracts, and then make sure that you check perform runtime contract checking. And this is the this guarantees, and only this guarantees that your uh, IL rewriter will run automatically as a post compile step and modifies the code produced by the compiler. And the final effect is that uh, the IL rewriter just consumes the contract information. Because at the end of the day, uh, the source code for uh, the method requires on the class contract. You can check that through uh, any decompiler tool. Uh, you, you can snoop into the implementation of requires and ensures. If you do so, you will see that all of that these methods do is throwing an exception is uh, if the IL rewriter has not been enabled. That's it. They don't contain anything. They don't do nothing. They they they, they have they are nearly a no op. They have nearly a no-hop implementation. So what's really the purpose of requires, ensures, and more in general, what really, what's really the purpose of the code contracts implementation? This lines are nearly meta information. So, oh, meta information, but uh, weren't attributes the way standard way in .NET to provide meta information about classes, about methods, about members. Yes, uh, typically in .NET you use attributes whenever you need to specify um, meta information. But the code contracts team decided to use code because code, of course, is a little bit more flexible than just attributes. Attributes are static. They are strings, so they allow you to use a text-based syntax for expressing your uh, requirements, your expectations. Uh, if you do that in code, you have a lot more flexibility. You can use lambda expressions, you can use uh, type expressions, uh, you have a lot more uh, of flexibility. But beyond that, the role of any calls you find in your code, you can place in your code that uses the contract class, the real purpose is providing meta information for the big brother. And now, once the big brother has been configured and runs, uh, it does some work on, uh, on your source code. So to, to, um, to check that, let me place uh, a breakpoint here and let's try to run this uh, this sample application. The breakpoint is hit at this point, and uh, what I want to show you now is uh, that this is that uh, 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 the disassembled uh, window for this code. So control function eleven, and this is what you see. This is the real x86 code that the system, the operating system, is running. Okay, the f this is the logical point where the if x equals y is uh, uh, implemented. And uh, 
This is the block of code, of x86 code, that represents the implementation of return x uh, shift 1. I invite you to focus on this particular line and this one which is exactly the same. So what do these two lines have in common? They are the final line for a return statement. So return x shift 1, it, it, doesn't, it doesn't end like in classic x86 code with a ret statement. The ret statement, the ret command is the command that returns, that clears up the stack. The implementation of return and plus expression is not ret, but it's just a jump. And we find the same jump to the same address also for return x plus y. And let's see what we find at the address jump. We find essentially the implementation of the post condition. So you see that whenever there is a return, and this is the job that the big brother, the IL rewriter specifically does, whenever it finds a return statement, it modifies the code and replaces the red statement with a jump to a common location where the post condition is evaluated. And after the evaluation of the code of the post condition, we finally find the red x86 statement that terminates. The uh, execution clears up the stack and passes the control to the next block of code in the algorithm, in the flow. This is the job that essentially uh, we see performed by the big brother. Finally, if you have a pretty complex uh, business domain, it makes sense that at some point you have uh, quite a few contract instructions, contract meta information to place in each and every method. So there is a way for you to collapse, to group a bunch of logically related uh, contract statements into a method call. This is exactly what I'm going to show in the next, uh, the next file. Uh, this is a complete rewrite of the previous, uh, the previous class, except that now I have uh, validate operands, validate result, validate operands for division, so I have uh, methods placed in the in the body of a method wherever uh, one or multiple contract statements were expected. Uh, validate operands is just a, a method that contains contract statements. But as you can see, any method that only contains contract statements is decorated with a special attribute. The special attribute is called contract abbreviator. Uh, it simply says that method marked as an abbreviator is just a placeholder for a bunch of contract uh, statements. Now, the, the, the funny thing is that uh, contract abbreviator is not a class that you find in the .NET framework. You have to create this class yourself. And in fact, in my sample code, you see a class called contract abbreviator which is a plain class that inherits from attribute. So there is no logic, no code, just nothing. It's a plain wrapper class. What really matters is the name of this class and the fact that this class is available in the context of a given application. But, uh, what's the purpose of this class? Well, basically, this is an attribute. It's another piece of meta information for the IL rewriter. So basically, the IL rewriter, which is not an official part, as I said, of the .NET 4 download, but it's uh, something, it's an external tool you download from uh, the, the Microsoft Research website. For this reason, the IL rewriter is uh, maintained and uh, fresher, newer releases uh, are made available at a different pace than the whole .NET 4 platform. So at some point in the past few months, uh, Microsoft released 
an updated version of the IL rewriter that knows about a class that is, now, it is named contract abbreviator. So the newest IL rewriter you can download today knows about contract abbreviator, but because this new feature was added at a later time, you will not find in the .NET native download any reference to this file. But it's because the IL runs is not code that is compiled with your main application, but it's a post-compile step. As long as you have a, a contract with that name in your uh, executable, the IL rewriter will be able to perfectly identify, uh, locate uh, abbreviations for contract information and proceed as usual. Let me move now to a second and final, I would say, example about uh, the third main category of uh, contracts you find. So we, we already spent some time on preconditions, on postconditions. Now it's time we talk about invariance. Invariance represents conditions that are always verified, conditions that always hold in the entire lifetime of a class. Hmm. You say, nice. But does it mean that the big brother is constantly looking into my class, is constantly monitoring the memory footprint of my objects? Well, not exactly. The big brother we are talking about, the big brother we have in, in, in code contracts is not exactly, it's not like the big brother of the popular George Orwell book. It's a, well, a big brother that is a sort of a friend more than, you know, a, a, a full-time supervisor. And specifically, this kind of big brother is only active whenever a public method, including the constructor and including setters, property setters, are invoked. So basically, by defining an invariant, you guarantee, through the IL work, that a call to your invariant method for the class is placed automatically right after the constructor is called, right after any property setter is called and any public method is called. Which means that after any action that will reasonably produce some state changes in your class, the validity, the invariance is checked. But if you call private members, protected members, so if you call non-public members which are not part of the public interface, then it is allowed that your class stays in an invalid, inconsistent state. It's more or less the same thing that happens in a transaction. Before and after the database transaction, the state must be consistent, but in within the transaction, in between the various steps of the transaction, before you commit, uh, the state of the tables are allowed to be inconsistent. So let me show you possibly a smart way of using invariant in the design of your domain model. Uh, domain models, building your own domain model is uh, a, a, a practice that is becoming more and more popular because of code first and because of uh, um, entity framework. So let's suppose that you want to write your own uh, domain model. You probably want to have a, a root object that I called domain object in my case and you want to introduce some sort of global validation in your domain model. So let's say that I have this I support validation interface uh, which simply has uh, a method is valid which returns a boolean. Now the domain object class has a method that I called object invariant. The name is arbitrary but uh, the signature private void is mandatory. This method is decorated with contract invariant method, an another uh, code contract attribute, and internally it calls the invariant method which evaluates a Boolean condition. So, what's going on? Basically, this method, a call to this method is placed after the constructor of this class or a public method on this class or a public setter on this class is called. You say, yes, but this class is abstract and doesn't have any public method. Yes, but this is going to be a root class. 
and inheritance works. Inheritance applies. So what we are actually doing is we, are, we, we will have uh, this method called automatically not through the mechanism of object orientation but through the mechanism of the IL rewriter. A call to this will be placed after any public endpoints in this class domain object and any class that derives from object from a domain object. And in my implementation, I call this is valid state from uh, the invariant, and is valid state just calls the abstract method that is part of the I support validation implementation. Uh, notice that uh, any function you call in uh, a contract expression whether it's the invariant, whether the postcondition, whether the precondition, if it's not a simply a simple a, a, a primitive expression, if it involves methods, those methods are to be marked as pure, and the pure attribute simply means that declares that this uh, that this function um, does not make any visible state change to the class. So finally. Once we have such a domain object, we create uh, derived classes like customer. Customer inherits from domain object. And uh, all that customer has to do is overriding the is valid method and uh, place in this override just the logic that for the customer class means to be in a valid state. So, for example, the customer here in this sample code is assumed to be valid if the ID is greater than zero, if company name is not null or uh, nor white space, and if the name the, the name of the company is at least uh, six uh, characters long. You can place here whatever logic that makes sense for your purposes, but you have a single place where you you place uh, the validation logic and the code contracts mechanics guarantees that is valid is called right after any call you make to the constructor to the setters of any public property and to any public method that your class may have all of this happens automatically and this is the guaranteed way to have that your classes are always in a valid state having said that let me also share a warning. My experience says that uh, having a class, creating classes based on invariance, may be too strong of a condition. So, limits significantly your uh, your movements, forces you to always play by the rule, which is great in the economy of a big project. Can sometimes end up being a, a sort of pain in the neck for uh, developers and uh, at this point I can only mention I cannot help but mentioning uh, uh, my one of my favorite sentences from Isaac Asimov he said once what humans what scares humans in computers is that once computers and computer programs are competently programmed they are absolutely honest okay now Let's move back to PowerPoint, and uh, after this long demo about uh, about code contracts, uh, let's uh, move ahead and uh, consider the role that code contracts play in the in the in the um, in the wider field of static analysis, and in particular, what's the relationship between uh, unit tests and uh, tools to improve correctness? What is a unit test? It is a uh, piece of code that executes other code. What are the characteristics of unit tests? You have a fixed input because you write a unit test and you provide fixed input values. You have observable results that help you to write assertions and of course you have assertions so the verification of Boolean conditions to ensure that the behavior of the method has been coherent um, with the fixed input. So given the input, observable results are coherent with the expectations. Okay, but uh, what does this really prove? 
<sighs> can we conclude from here that because we passed all of you uh, all our unit tests because we had we covered 80 percent of the source code with unit tests can we really conclude that our code is correct not necessarily not necessarily because uh, because of the of the assertions assertions are things you write you or the testing team writes assertions are things you write based on uh, input you provide so what a unit test is really tells you about the correctness of a program that is that given that input the behavior of the method is correct but the unit test per se is not to guarantee that the input you put into the unit test is relevant for the real world real time behavior of the method and the application more in general let's consider now analysis a static analysis tool is a, a tool that reads other code reads not runs not executes by reading the source code this tool learns facts about uh, your variables about your functions about the structure of your code and it knows how to relate facts in knows for example that the output of the variable x is going to be the input of function y and uh, it can relate the two things if he know if he knows facts about x or about y it can put the two things together and make some logical calculation and emits warnings if it finds out that the, you, you're going to pass incoherent and consistent input to a function and uh, the tool in this case emits warnings and uh, usually a static analyzer emits uh, way too many warnings sometimes too many to the point that the, the, you, the developer feels authorized to ignore all of them so what does an analyzer really prove well it proves that detected relations between parts are coherent is this enough mm, not necessarily not necessarily because uh, not necessarily you can provide all the information that the analyzer really needs the analyzer is uh, gives you stronger more relevant information than a unit test because uh, the analyzer acts as a big brother it's uh, if competently programmed it's absolutely honest the unit tests instead are written by developers for themselves or and you know humans are not like computers even with the best intentions so remember Cassandra I put here a link to the to this little piece of Greek uh, mythology. Uh, Cassandra was um, a, a goddess uh, that was given the gift of prophecy, and then uh, because he, he, she disappointed another god, Apollo, uh, she had placed the course. Uh, according to to that, uh, no one would ever believe uh, predictions. So in this case, I would say that a static analyzer is a sort of the Cassandra of software. It gives you a lot of predictions about possible bugs, possible places in your code where you're going to have some uh, some problems, but uh, some bugs, uh, but it's just a prediction. A static analysis warning is definitely not going to be necessarily uh, a sure bug, but you better have a look because forewarned is always for harm. So to finalize testing is a, a way to catch regression according to the coverage of code you have and the relevance of your tests. What you do is testing input data and uh, unit tests are essentially a black box testing tool. With uh, uh, code correctness and analysis tools uh, like the static checker in, um, in code contracts, one of the, the big brother tools of code contracts, uh, you can catch logical bugs as you code and uh, what is being tested is the logical flow of your application in a sort of white box uh, testing uh, um, 
approach. Uh, by the way, let me switch back for a moment to Visual Studio just to show you that uh, uh, the static checker is a facility you need to implicitly activate always from the properties, the code contracts page properties of your project. Should you go with uh, code contracts, correctness tool, static analysis tools, or with tests? Of course, one doesn't exclude the other. They are orthogonal and both help you just in different ways. Code contracts provide guidance for refactoring and help a lot in having highly readable code. Tests, they are just yet another program whose correctness is still to be proven. And my bottom line is that in a perfect world, tests are just suggested by a static analyzer that reads and understands the terms of service of your methods. Does this tool exist? You might want to have a look at PEX from the link below. Thank you. It has been a pleasure. And if you have some questions, please send them. Uh, great, thank you so much, Dino. Um, we are we don't have any questions just yet, but I'll we'll give people a moment to uh, type them in. Yep. Let's see. From Greg Harris, he says, "Wow, what an eye opener! Thanks so much, Dino. If you can suggest any good books, I would appreciate it." Good books? Oh yes, my books. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, <laughs> not not my books, but uh, no, I don't know actually uh, about uh, um, any good books that is. Uh, entirely dedicated to code contracts. Uh, for sure I can tell you that uh, I do have some, um, some uh, 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 of these topics covered uh, uh, both in my ASP.NET 4 books so which was published uh, this spring and I'm gonna have uh, the same in my next NDC book uh, which is uh, uh, revised for version 3 of the framework will be available uh, this November I think. Uh, beyond that, I would recommend uh, that you have a look at my MSDN magazine articles, uh, which are free and they are uh, from the link that I presented at the beginning of the presentation. Okay, and let's see, uh, from James, what is the relationship between code contracts and spec? Code contracts and? Uh, spec? S-P-E-C, uh, oh, sorry, pound sign. Oh, okay, 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 okay. Um, exception ending, essentially. Um, well, uh, code contracts uh, in some way simplify your uh, exception ending because they provide you with uh, a more compact syntax uh, that in some cases can save you the burden of doing exception ending yourself. However, however, the main purpose of code contracts uh, is not replacing exception ending. Exception ending spans over the entire spectrum of the application. Uh, the, 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 the part of the code in which exception ending and code contracts uh, overlap and for that overlapping you might want to prefer code contracts because of the more compact syntax is for the validation of input parameters in a method. So a good programming practice uh, of all time uh, says uh, before, before you start doing any significant work in a method, please check that the input data you are receiving, input parameters, uh, are valid according to whatever rule uh, you have to uh, you have to, to check. And you might want to do that using an if statement and then throwing an exception, doing some sort of you know, simplified exception ending. Uh, in that regard, the code contracts work. Everything else, they are different because uh, they don't provide, and are not supposed to provide the try-catch block. They are not supposed to provide to catch an end of exception. They are just a way to throw exception themselves and they can save you from uh, explicit validation of parameters through an if-then throw pattern. Okay. 
Um, let's see from Greg. I have generally written my own classes for validation. How do contracts compare to validation classes regarding overhead? Uh, code contracts, uh, code contracts uh, represent a bit of overhead, like uh, any form of validation. I would say that it's a, a relatively thin overhead. It's kept to a minimum. However, if you are concerned about uh, code contracts uh, representing a significant uh, uh, slowdown for your app, consider that uh, you can disable on a build basis, on a per build basis, code contracts. So you can have uh, code contracts enabled through the properties page only for, say, debug builds, but not for release builds. In this case, the code is entirely stripped off, the IL rewriter doesn't run, and um, your code is uh, as if no contracts instruction uh, was in place. The only exception to this rule is when you use uh, uh, contract dot requires of T, because in that case uh, the contract instruction is uh, translated one to one has a if then throw statement, and because you want to throw explicitly your own exception, then that code is uh, not stripped off, is uh, maintained in the compiled code regardless of the settings for code contracts you enable on a per build basis. Okay, and from Matthew, will code contracts likely be used in the .NET framework where the guard pattern and exceptions throwing are presently in place? Uh, excuse me, can you, can, you, can you please repeat? Yes. Uh, will code contracts likely be used in the .NET framework where the guard pattern and exceptions thrown are presently in place? Uh, code contracts that throw the, typically throw the, the, their own exceptions and uh, they have a there's a centralized uh, handler uh, for which you can there's a centralized event on the contract class uh, from which you that you can for which you can write a handler and take total control over the exception handling being done per a violated contract. Okay. Uh, that is all the questions. So with that, uh, we can go ahead and wrap it up. Any parting words, Dino? Yeah, me. I, I just hope that uh, I just hope that everything was uh, was useful to uh, to to everybody, and um, I I invite you, people, developers, to try at least code contracts. Uh, what I can say is that personally. Uh, I've been an early adopter of code contracts. I started using them uh, before the release of .NET 4. By the way, code contracts are also available through a separate download from the Microsoft Research website, also for .NET 3.5. So they are integrated in 4, but they are still available as a separate feature in 3.5. I started using contracts in 3.5. I learned the hard way, and uh, today most of my code entirely my new code is based on code contracts. I especially enjoy using code contracts uh, in the definition of my domain models. That is the right place to consider, the first right place to consider using code contracts. Thank you again to all the attendees. Great, thank you Dino. And again if you missed anything from this webinar or want to review any previous webinars or check out hundreds of online product tutorials, visit us on the DevExpress channel at tv.devexpress.com. Again, thanks so much to Dino. Thank you all for joining us, and thanks for choosing DevExpress.